Hello again, welcome to my Friday podcast for September 29th, 2017. First of all, I'd like to thank David Adcox for the different banners that you're going to see on that I'll have up throughout October for Breast Cancer Awareness Month um, as Storm features their Paint the Lands Pink initiative. I asked for one and he gave me five, so I'll be able to change them every few days and kind of spice up a little bit throughout the month. I've also asked him to design me a regular banner instead of that weird looking cloud thing that I just kind of had to Google because I don't art. Um, hopefully I can also get some other special edition banners for other special occasions or special, you know, certain ball releases or something like that. So um, many thanks to David for helping out, helping me out in an area that I'm absolutely completely uh, tragically helpless in. Uh, I'm trying to continually improve the quality of the channel and I think that this will be a big facelift for my main page. I'm trying to give it more of a professional feel, um, and you can also see that I've kind of got this this setup here now. I went out this week and got a desk and a chair and a um, little blue hat for my microphone here, and uh, I have my little netbook here too. I've also got a lot of memorabilia and some posters and stuff that I'm going to put up, so these shelves back here will be gone and I'll have some posters and stuff up, but uh, hopefully I'll have that put together a little bit better for next week. Uh, this past week, the channel also hit a couple of milestones. I hit 1,500 subscribers and 400,000 total video views, so I can't say thank you enough. Uh, the crazy thing is that 1,100 of those subscribers and 300,000 of those views have just happened since January 1 this year, so um, that's that's kind of crazy. Uh, having gone back and looked at some of my older videos, the quality's been quite a bit better this year. Uh, once I got to that point where I kind of realized, hey, this is, people like my stuff and this is working out, I started putting a lot more effort into it. You know, aside, aside from the couple of orange videos um, earlier this year because I was having trouble figuring out the settings on my new editing software, um, I'm trying to get a lot more consistent in execution here too. Instead of seeing one video that's really zoomed in and one that's really zoomed out, I'm trying to figure, I'm trying to make it, I've got, I've got what I'm th you know, I've got what I'm doing figured out, basically, or I'm figuring it out better than I used to have it. I mean, just just like this, like the lighting from uh, this week is totally different because I have the light in front of me instead of behind me. I mean, last week I looked like I was auditioning for a new Blair Witch Project movie or something. And now with the lighting in front of me, I mean, there you go. So uh, it's kind of weird to think how I used to put up videos and I'd get like 400 views over the span of a month and the random subscriber every couple days or something. And uh, now I get several subscriptions a day plus I get over a thousand videos or a thousand videos a thousand views a day and in YouTube language it's not like that's huge because there's there are channels that have millions of subscribers and will get like 10,000 views every 10 minutes or something uh, but for a guy in the middle of the country that makes bowling videos uh, I'm, I'm I'm really glad that you're that makes me happy and I'm glad that you're happy with what I do so uh, let's see here Swiss trios in Wichita went well last weekend uh, that was too far uh, we were a few points from cashing. You know, we caught several rough draws throughout the weekend, a little bit more than our fair share, I think, but that's kind of the way it goes. Uh, it's also always frustrating to catch a team that has one of the biggest sets in the house, and you look a bunch of pairs that way and a bunch of pairs that way, and you beat virtually anybody else that you'd have bowled. But that's kind of how it goes with that format, so it happened to everybody. Uh, bottom line, you just have to weather the storms and just bowl better. I mean, even the team that won the thing had a couple of rough draws too, so it's bowling is going to happen. Main thing is keep your composure, continue to focus on your ball reaction, what you need to do to uh, keep the ball around the pocket, make spares. Made a handful of big shots throughout the weekend. Uh, I only missed one makeable spare. That's the four pin that we're not going to talk about. We all missed a bunch of four pins that game for some reason. I won most of my personal points, so aside from uh, you know a few games where I didn't throw it great, I, kept, I at least kept myself out of trouble. And uh, I was really happy with how I did and how the team did overall. Uh, we at least kept ourselves in the conversation, so that was nice. Um, there were a lot of big names there. Uh, the nationally known ones would be like uh, Wes Malott, Cameron Doyle, Wesley Lowe, Justin Hromick. And there was a lot of local guys and just a million Wichita State alums that all throw it you know, insanely good, too. So... Um, the lane pattern was Sunset Strip. I threw the Marvel Pearl for the first three games and then two different hustle links for the last nine games. So if you've seen my recent video here, um, the hustle link versus the hustle link, it features the new one that I drilled up that I said last week that I was I was drilling up for the tournament. And it might even be better than the, the first one that I drilled up. 
that I had, you know, that had my review video and everything that I was really impressed with to begin with. Now, even with the four-inch pin, it didn't flare a ton because it's still, you know, only 030 on the differential. Uh, the 2000 Surface actually looked really good too. So I think it easily outperforms the IQ Tour Solid. The back end transitions cleaner. It hits harder. It doesn't quit on the back end from deeper angles like the IQ tends to do if you get a little too deep. It didn't chug or burn up early. It was still strong on the back end. It worked extremely well from any angle. I mean, it still looked good when I got in really deep and was essentially just kind of fading it through the middle towards the end of the day. I mean, it was still strong off the deck. And I don't think that there's a better performance ball for the price out there. I, I said in my opinion video for it that you, you could probably have uh, three different ones with three different layouts, three different surfaces, and have yourself a really competitive bag. I mean, I still might put, uh, like I said in the video, I might put a two and a half inch pin on another one, see what happens there. Uh, even when I've had two of the same ball before, normally I just drill the one with the layout that I know I'm going to like and just use it as a box. I'm a box surface kind of guy, so normally that's what happens. And if I drill a second one, it's just, it's got a it's got a specific layout, it's got a specific surface on it, but it's, it's more for tournaments or kind of a, you know, niche situations when um, I'm going to a certain tournament or on a certain pattern or something like that. Um, but this one, they both look so good the entire weekend that I'm just going to take them both around with me to league. I, I use I used both of them last night. Um, normally, normally the five and a, the five and a quarter pin box surface isn't isn't quite enough for the league conditions. It was last night. The lanes were a little bit on the drier side, so I was able to use that one the whole night and it looked really good. Aside from some execution errors on my part, um, but even then, it, it's still a, it's still a great spare ball too. If I'm not you know, using it for my strike ball. Um, next, we're going to revisit the hot sell situation, and I'm just going to be really honest here. You know, honesty and being as straightforward as possible is kind of what this channel is built on. That's not going to change anytime soon. Uh, for starters, I'm still making a video for it. I'm I, the, the a hot sell video is still coming, but here's the thing: I hate urethane. I hate urethane. I will never get along with urethane. Um, I don't like the urethane shape of all the things I have trouble with. Getting a ball to sit on the back end is not one of them. Most of the time, it's really rather I need help getting the ball up the hill. Uh, if I want to smooth it out on the back end, I can do that myself. I can throw a little bit harder. I can lay out of it a little bit. I can straighten it out if I want to. But my problems come in when I try to help a ball or when I try to help it shape up. My head gets, you know, my head gets stooped and I start getting grabby. And so the only time that I would ever throw urethane is to throw it for a video and then it would be gone. So that's kind of just that. Now, the only way to do a hot sell video correctly is to compare it to the pitch black because that's all anybody cares about. Uh, that That's the one question. That's pretty well the one and only question that anybody wants to know with the hot sell is how does it compare to the pitch black? Because the pitch black is kind of the urethane standard right now. So... Uh, I, I can't give you any any information about staff contracts or what we pay for equipment or whatever. I wish I could because I'd help you understand where I'm coming back, coming from or where I'm at a little bit better in the situation, but you'll just have to trust me. Uh, I, I couldn't justify buying a hot sell in a pitch black for a video. I just couldn't. Uh, mostly because I'd never, or, you know, I'd never use them again, but kind of mostly because I don't feel like I have the best angle on it, and yes, the, that pun was totally intended. Uh, I'm glad a lot of people consider me somewhat of an authority on Storm or Roto Grip equipment, but I can tell you, I'll be the first to tell you that that doesn't extend to urethane. Um, Tamar Bowling did a really good review on it, so uh, I advise you to go check that out if you haven't seen it already. But I don't feel comfortable reviewing a ball that I'm probably not going to like personally. I mean, the Hot Cell might be the best urethane ball ever made, and I'm still not going to like it. It's not going to be a hustle link situation where I'm just uh, drill it and throw it and see what happens, and I'm like, okay, whatever, and then I throw it, and then I'm going to like it. That It's urethane. It's not going to happen. Uh, so what I'm working on is a collaboration with another friend and or with another staffer and a friend of mine, Kevin Andes. Uh, Kevin has a great game top to bottom. I know that you're going to like watching him throw the ball in the video. So I'm going to get his thoughts and opinions on it. I'm going to watch him throw the ball and then I'm going to put it in my words and do like a normal review like I normally do. It's just going to be, he's going to be throwing the ball. So, you know, again, I, I don't like urethane and I didn't want... I didn't want that biasing or tainting what should be an objective review. 
um, in this specific instance, I don't I don't feel qualified to give a good year a good a good review on a urethane ball based on me personally throwing it. So, I mean, I still have a very good eye and understanding for ball reactions, so I have a really solid idea what the ball does, and I'm gonna have. Um, I, I just think that I'm going to have a better read on it watching Kevin throw it. I'll have him fill me on sp some specifics or uh, particular nuances he's feeling from throwing it. Uh, I'm going to segue into urethane balls in general now. I've had several questions about kind of the urethane resurgence the last couple of years. I'm going to credit viewer Jason Platt with prompting this segment. Uh, urethane's back in style in a big way. I mean, you have guys like Jesper Svensson throwing it pretty well exclusively if he can get away with it. And then you've seen a lot of other guys using it on TV like Tommy Jones, Marshall Kent, Kyle Troop, Tom Doherty, uh, the Tang brothers, just to name a few of them. Uh, if you watch the PBA qualifying on Extra Frame, you'll see even more on them. Uh, as, you know, the big thing with urethane's control, and the reason it's gotten big again, specifically in college and on tour, is that generally the oil volumes are heavier up front, the back ends are really clean, and that creates a lot of length and a lot of pop on the back end. And when you have when you have such good bowlers that throw the ball so well, that can create some kind of interesting issues that you wouldn't you wouldn't think would be a problem, but when <sighs> When the when the shots are so challenging, you're going to run into problems like uh, like nine pins, uh, stone fours, high flush four nines, or maybe you catch a little bit of friction and the ball really jumps. That's not going to happen with urethane. Uh, I mean, while it's nice to see reactive throw pins everywhere, they just with the strength of today's stuff and as good as they throw it, they just don't need that most of the time. I mean, urethane's predictable and consistent. It's early, it's smooth. You can be nice and slow and easy with it. And ultimately, it offers the user more control over the ball reaction than just kind of putting the ball out there and letting it do what it does. Strong reactive balls are really good for those with lower rev rates or who really just have that one good A game. Uh, but the better bowlers and pros have so many mechanical tricks that they can turn a four pin into a ball that hits perfectly flush in the pocket just with a tiny little change that they do with their hand position or something without changing balls, without making some big change with their feet or something. Um, urethane allows the user more control than resin by a pretty significant margin so when the shots touchy or spotty and control is needed urethane is always going to be the easy decision Till the hot cell traditional or mainstream urethanes also had weaker cores or lower flaring cores so it used to be said if your track if your track was a dime the size of a dime or smaller that you were really good or really consistent bowler because the cores didn't flare there was no track migration and once once you got some use on the ball, you'd see the track on there, and if you were an accurate or consistent bowler, it would usually be pretty small. There have been a few other different urethane experiments from you know some other less prominent companies that or that you know weren't made weren't made recently enough to really be popular or garner a lot of attention. Uh, but urethane works really well to blend out wet dry. It has enough traction and oil and enough of a move on friction to make it viable. Smooth that it smooths out the reaction just enough to make it beneficial. I mean, plastic obviously doesn't hook a whole lot and it's really smooth. But at the same time, it just it doesn't have enough traction or enough shape for it really to be a consideration. Uh, urethane is kind of that perfect spot right between plastic and kind of low end ure or ure low end resin balls, and uh, urethane's. It just it just fits, you know. I I don't see the trend slowing down or going away anytime soon, especially with the growth of the two-handed game, and that's probably what's actually really driving the the urethane resurgence. They have all the power and the speed. They don't need a ball helping them out. They need the control that urethane offers. So, uh, you know, they need a ball to be more on the tame side, unless they're like Belmo, who has a really good look with reactive, but he still throws urethane and sometimes even plastic. So that's what I think about the urethane situation. Uh, now we're going to segue into talking a little bit about two-handers. That's been another big topic over the last several years, really the last five or six. I mean, Belmo's been around for, what, seven or eight years now? He's been around for a while, but uh, it's created a lot of buzz on both sides of the opinion. Is it good? Is it bad? Uh, my opinion is that they found a better way to do it, and traditionalists are pissed. Uh, one of our games at Trios was actually against Wesley Lowe. Uh, on certain shots, what Wesley can do that one-handed bowlers can't, it really seems unfair. I mean, 
when you're a one-handed bowler watching that, unless you're like EJ Tackett or something, it can be extremely demoralizing to make it look like they've got a lot of room. And when if they just touch the head pin somewhere, pins go flying everywhere. And when you have a two-hander at their best, you really just have to be perfect and hope that they get tapped somewhere. The way it's always been is that power and control kind of went in opposite directions. I mean, higher control would cost you power, and higher power would cost you some control, but the two-handers found a way to increase both, more, more specifically Belmo. Um, and whether you like the two-handed game or not, you can't say that it's not fun to watch. I mean, even while his team was beating us, it was, I mean, it was still impressive. I mean, it was just honestly impressive to watch him throw the ball. Now, it got him into trouble a couple times, I think, like I said, but that's kind of the trade-off there, but pretty good and one of the bigger questions too was longevity like how long are these two-handers going to be able to hold up as age and wear catches up to them uh, regardless of your personal opinions about belmo or whether you like the two-handed thing or not he's the most impressive bowler to me on the planet right now i mean if you watch how his game has proge progressed and kind of changed over the last five years he is mechanically so Everything mechanically is just its so quiet and so smooth and so efficient now that I think he actually puts less effort, less physical effort into it than guys like Tommy Jones and EJ Tackett. I mean, his bowling IQ is off the charts. It's evidence in everything that he does. His eye for reaction is extremely good. His feel for situations is extremely good. He's also lost a fair amount of weight, which is going to make it even easier on his body and mechanics. I mean, a lot of these two-handers still have fairly aggressive approaches like Wesley and like Oscu Palerma. I think if these guys can copy Belmo and kind of quiet everything down a little bit, that's going to help them out uh, You know, quite a bit. They're going to be doing themselves a huge favor. They may not realize it until 20 years from now. But uh, you know, when they're 45 or 50, they're going to be glad that they made those changes. Uh, Belmo's raw power has decreased a little bit, but I think that that's kind of a positive. Sometimes all that speed and uh, all those revs can get you into trouble fairly quickly. Um, but at every point, he's found a way to improve in every area and every facet of the game. You know, I, I still, still think that he'd been a dominant player if he'd have just been one-handed because he, he's so smart and he's so good that I think he still would have been good. Would he, be, would he have been as dominant? I don't know. I can't answer that. Um, but I don't, I don't think two-handed bowler bowling's going anywhere. I don't, but I also don't think it's going to dominate or overshadow traditional bowling. I mean, ha getting to watch some of the guys like Wes Malott and some other guys that you might know, like Chris Prather and Devin Bidwell. I've seen Francois Lavoie in, in person several times too. He's really impressive to watch and he doesn't do a whole lot to the ball. Uh, dozens of other guys that just throw it so impossibly good with one hand. I mean, traditional bowling is not going anywhere. I think that guys like EJ Tackett have kind of figured out how to compete with the two-handed bowlers, too. Uh, I think they've even kind of pushed guys like Belmo to improve and refine what he does because EJ's found a way to get the same speed and the same revs with just one hand. So, um, you know, I think that two-handed bowling makes bowling better because it... It's pushing everyone else to get better to compete, and so I'm kind of looking at the, the bigger picture. Anything you can push, push the anytime you can push something into progress or even just into change to see how it evolves, that's a good thing. Sometimes rules need to be pushed or broken just to see what happens. Uh, sometimes it makes you ask tough questions like, should this even be legal? I think it should, but guys like Mike Machuga don't agree. Uh, and while I don't agree with him, it's pretty hard to argue his points. And I get where he's coming from because his his he has the best interest of the sport in mind. Myself, I tend to favor the PWBA because it's more of a pure skill contest than a carry contest. Uh, that, a lot of power can kind of turn it into that. I like watching the women bowl because it's more about accuracy. I'm not saying the guys can't be accuracy, but I don't like throwing pins. Kind of gets throwing pins around is uh, is cool to watch, but it can kind of get old after a while specifically when you see big misses getting covered up by power. I don't like that. Yeah, it's impressive, but at the same time, at the same time it's kind of not. So I think that's going to do it for this week's podcast. Next week I'll pick up where I left off here, and I'm going to talk a little bit of PWBA. The last bit of information today is that the 2018 U.S. Open is going to be in Wichita, Kansas at North Rock Lanes. So I'm looking forward to being able to go and see that in person. Wichita's only a couple hours away. 
so it uh, should be a good time hopefully I can uh, get some good video and put some stuff up on my channel but uh, I also have a couple ball videos that are going to be up in the next few days and then I will see you next Friday so thank you very much for watching